And I'm gonna hand it over to Seamus Kraft. He's the executive director of the OpenGov Foundation and a former congressional staffer. So Seamus, I'll take it over. For Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Um, should we jump right in? Sure. Chris Nels from the Democracy Fund over here helped lead the creation of a very non-traditional way uh, to view Congress in all of its uh, glory, uh, good, bad, and ugly. Um, mapping not just the institution, but the relationships on the inside and on the outside in the United States of America. Chris, where did this come from? Well, this is a systems map. It, res it reflects uh, the Amidiar groups. Uh, so I work at Democracy Fund, uh, which you probably already know, but that is part of the broader uh, Amidiar group. And across the whole group, um, that we've adopted a systems thinking uh, methodology for making investments and guiding our strategy and strategic development. So this, uh, the map uh, process, the mapping process is, is the first stage of our strategic plan, uh, multi-year strategic planning process. It's a multi-year strategy, but it took multiple years to, to actually finish it. So um, that's it's a joke. So the, uh, <clears throat> the map itself is, is a way for us to understand where there's leverage in the system. Uh, the added bonus for the community in which you're working in is then you have this great document that you've consulted a, a, a large group of experts to help build, you build that that community can then uh, use to, to kind of understand their own system and their place in it and, and get a, a good sense of how the dynamics in that very complicated system are working. Right on, thank yeah. you. And uh, for those of you watching at home or playing uh, from the audience on a laptop or mobile device, uh, you can pull this up and drill down. It's democracyfund.org slash congress map. Yeah, and, and just, one, just one note, um, we made, recently made some revisions uh, thinking a little bit more about the issue of oversight. Uh, so the, I guess the southeastern quadrant of the map, if you will, or kind of the bottom right-hand side, um, that's all live on the website, and it's, it's been updated, but there's not text yet for that. So just stay tuned for that. We're kind of updating that as we go. So I apologize for that not being ready for today. But Well, thank you. And uh, if, I, if I may read a little bit from the Democracy Fund report that accompanies this map. Um, Over recent years, Congress is broken has become a common refrain by voices inside and outside of the institution. The legislative branch neither engages effectively with those who it seeks to represent, nor makes headway on substantive issues. Sugarcoat it, why don't you? Uh, special interests, meanwhile, have undue influence over what policy its chambers do advance. Um, Daniel, is this a diagram uh, of despair <laughs> or a map to the promised land? Because I see a lot of shoots and not too many ladders. It seems a lot like a Rorschach test, doesn't it? I mean, you can see whatever you want <laughs> in, in the map. Um, see, I'm glad one person found it funny. Hey Thank you. It's, a, it's appreciated. <laughs> Uh, so I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. There's there's a lot of ways of uh, looking at the way that that Congress functions. Um, you know, we have this map. There's also a really good map that the Library of Congress has put together, sort of like a functional map of like the different boxes of of sort of where things fit. I think that there's a lot of insights that are embedded in this. I mean, it it does help identify where some of the problems are in the way that Congress is functioning. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, we've taken what is Gosh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid like jargon. Like people talk about things like felt needs, which is like a terrible phrase. But but the pinch points that people have, like you know, th this this it does a great job of making it abstract. But I think part of what we need to do here is push it back down into like where are the problems that each of us are having. Uh, like you know, if if you work in a support office, like where where do the problems that your office is having and trying to accomplish things like how does that fit in here and how how can you see it? Or if you're in a personal office, I mean, we had. Um, you know, Rep Heard, who was talking about his ability to uh, find allies, or and he didn't talk about it because he's you know more savvy than I am, but also to find you know likely identify likely opponents of things and how do you engage with them? So how does that fit into here when you're trying to move legislation or engage in oversight or engage with constituents? So I think there, I think this is a useful tool to sort of you know that that sort of abstracts out like the problems that we're having, and then we really need to think about like you know those four orange circles in the middle, you know, that, you know, like, like, what is that, like, what are the specific examples of those things that people are having and how can we address that as well? So I think this is, this is a great, like, 30,000 foot approach to, to looking at uh, Congress and, and how it functions. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. that was long-winded. No, no, I think that's fair. And 
that you you highlight kind of the core stories, the 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 different colored uh, arrows there that make the loops are kind of the macro stories. And I mean, you don't need a, a map to know that most of those stories are are pretty ugly right now. And and you know, kind of the outer one is about the the political challenges facing institution because of the electoral process and and how competitive and and hyper partisan our country's political moment is right now and how it's reflected in Congress. Um, everybody here also is well aware of the fact that Congress is under uh, resourced, uh, both from a financial standpoint and a, and a, you know, this is why part of why this, con you know, this whole conference is here, figuring out ways to, to boost its capacity. Um, and there's real, real challenges there. Um, there's real challenges with the issue of how do you get people to care about their elected, you know, elected uh, system of government again? And, you know, turnout's not great. Um, you know, these are stories that I think we have to understand in the context of the, the system here in Washington, but you know, the details of the map, I think point to a lot of opportunity. Uh, you know, we tried to capture kind of the 30,000 foot view, absolutely, but, but understanding how people are working in the system and the choices they're making every day uh, to make the system more functional or less functional, um, to listen to some people or not others. And um, you know, I think that if you think of the map not as really just a diagram of like gloom and doom or uh, my my boss Betsy Hawkins likes to call the the red and yellow stuff the death spiral. You know, that's certainly bad, but there are ways the system can mitigate the bad. That I think the the map or just thinking about your place in the system can can help you with. So I hope that's how people can use this tool. Can I just, yeah. uh, just add one more thing on, on top of that? So, uh, in when, we, when this conference started six years ago or when a lot of us started working on these issues, you know, there was a big sort of push around 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, nobody paid attention, generally speaking, on the outside to congressional technology. There were a couple of folks like CMF, but generally speaking, nobody was there. There was major process problems. Like we were, we were still stuck in Thomas land in terms of like how we were getting access to data and there was a lot of other information that was hard to do. You know, like a lot of the tools and systems didn't exist. And when there was attempts to have conversations either internally or between internal and external stakeholders, like those conversations would get shut down. Like there was a very negative cycle that, that existed. And in part because of the people that are in this room and because of people who, who aren't here, like some of the folks in leadership and elsewhere and, and, and prior folks who pushed on this, we were able to turn what was a negative cycle into something that is positive. Where we can see, I mean, I mean, you saw the presentations from the bulk data task force earlier. I mean, there's maybe 300 people on the planet who will get and who will care about what most of what was being talked about there, but the effects of that affect all of us. Uh, and that is because of the way we've been able to change the cycle. So, so when I look at this map, you know, I, I can see like where there's uh, sort of negative externalities and that are creating these problems, but at the same time, I know that from what we've done here, um, that it is possible, even for things that are wonky, even for things that aren't going to play well on TV, that uh, we can go in, in and turn the cycle around because because we've been doing it. So. That's awesome. Thank you, and I think that's a good a good moment to recognize how successful this entire endeavor has been. And uh, you know, we've got some doorstop award winners just in this room. Uh, Kirsten and Reynolds and Congressman Hurd, um, because they're taking these negative externalities and, and judo flipping them into opportunities. But this is not, you know, this type of visual design thinking is not a traditional way to look at Congress or any government institution. I mean, Chris, through the process of developing this, and I know, uh, Daniel, that you contributed to it, um, how has it changed your thinking? Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really, you know, I didn't work in Congress before I started. Um, you know, I was familiar enough with other experiences, but, uh, you know, getting in the weeds with the people that helped us build this map, um, both the people that worked in Congress, worked with Congress, um, you know, I, the thing that really struck, stuck out to me um, is how much agency people have in the system still, and by this is, I mean, in, within Congress. Um, and if you look at the map, I, I know it's very hard to read, um, from here, uh, even with the, the the jumbotron, but the light blue circles are are factors that are internally focused, like uh, parts of the the inside workings of Congress, um, and most of those are are decisions that staff and members are making. Um, and you see, there's a lot of those blue circles around. So there's a lot of decisions that people are making in the institution. Um, 
some of which are, are, are being kind of negative, but, but could potentially flip around and, and create positive change or work against those negative you know, ex, uh, externalities or, or major trends we're talking about. So you know, I think reminding yourself, uh, you know, I think the thing that stuck out for us is, is reminding ourselves um, how much agency and how much even power that, that even the rank and file member, the backbenchers, uh, the, the staff, have in the choices that they make and how to run their offices, or how to interact with one another, and how to to demand things from leadership, um, and and to try to make the institution better. And you know that was kind of heartening to me. It you know the big stuff's scary. There are and you know there's a lot of. I mean the other thing that stuck out is that people are really risk averse because of the the big you know challenges out there with the the political environment. Um, and with kind of the, you know, the, the decades-long trends now of, of how Congress has been uh, kind of kicked around a while, and, and really by, even by itself, members themselves who've kicked the institution around a, a fair amount. So uh, people, people are fairly risk-averse, but if you kind of change that mentality, we all kind of work on that together, I think that there's a, a tremendous amount of potential here. Uh, to restore the institution to what it should be, and and that's really exciting. So I think, you know, it was kind of there was kind of a happy ending here, I think, and that was or, or potential one, and that was nice to learn. I think. So, sorry for that rambling answer. But. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, to me, I mean, what this highlights is the power of feedback loops. I mean, in, in the, and it was obvious sort of before, but like the ability, if you can go and find a small place. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but a, a small thing where you can make a change and that change leads to another change and it creates a feedback loop and you can start making it sort of bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, the, you know, the example that I mentioned before is, is what we're doing here, where it started off with very, very small things and we were able to find like what the different stakeholders needs. External, like, you know, I was on civil society side, so we wanted more transparency about what was happening on the inside and technology was a way of getting there. Uh, the folks inside, Congress, you know, transparency was an effective argument to some of them, but a lot of them, what they really wanted to do was to save money. Uh, because we live in an environment where Congress is putting less and less funds towards itself. They want better tools as well, but they really wanted to save money. So transparency, saving money, and technology, and what you started doing was they started feeding back on each other. So, okay, maybe we don't need to print the congressional record and deliver it to all the congressional offices. Maybe we can print it to just those who want it and make the rest of it available online. And in making it available online, let's make it available in a digital format that's useful and not just have it be like a picture of a PDF, right? N not very exciting, but somewhat exciting. Okay, and, and in doing that, we're gonna save a quarter of a million or half a million dollars a year. Oh, okay, that's something. Well, we can do that same thing, not just for that, but we can do it for the staff directory, which we don't have to print anymore. We don't have to do it for that. We can do it for um, you know, uh, the calendars that come out. Okay, so you start doing this and you start, there's more stuff that's available online, there's more data that comes from it, there's more money that's being saved, that money can then be pushed into going and making what's available online, so we're gonna have an API, or we're going to have it available in bulk, like what GPO is publishing a lot of the day. You know, and slowly it feeds back on itself. And you know, the first couple of times around the circle, you don't see a, a big change. But six, seven years, eight, nine years into it, you start seeing more and more significant changes. You see, you know, when I started doing this, you know, we were talking about how do you change technology? And what we ended up doing was changing culture um, that is also affecting technology. Uh, and it's that culture change, which is the hardest thing of anything to do, um, that ultimately, regardless of, like, of, of what else happens, like, that will continue, that will persist. Right on. So, so it's, you know, this map is of, culture and how people behave, and we've figured out to some extent how do we actually go and change that culture. Um, I and mean, this is a legislative data and transparency conference. We talk about it in those terms because those are terms that make sense to folks, but this is really about changing Congress so that it works better in our modern context. Uh, and, and, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, and I can say other obvious things, but that's the, 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 the one that like what's happening here uh, says the most to me. Thank you, uh, and I just have to stop and say how cool it is to have heard responsive web design and demos, not memos, and I believe I saw a uh, government employee ticking off uh, GitHub issues repo by repo earlier. I mean, to your point about the arc of where we've traveled since the Ledge Data Transparency Conference and Bulk Legislative Task Force started, 
like this is just a snapshot of, of where we are today and the work that we have left to do. And if I could share a story about how this map and process has changed our thinking and our product development efforts at the Open Gov Foundation already, um, you know, we pivoted to look at engagement because of this in a far broader sense. It's not just legislation, although legislation is the most important data. You know, the engagement piece of it is such a such an awesome opportunity. We heard Will Hurd earlier talk about, I believe the quote was, the tools that I have are terrible to engage my constituents. That's the other half of his life. Um, and you know, what, what this process has driven us to do is to start uh, developing a product called Article One in partnership with uh, one of the awesome constituent management system vendors on the Hill, Fireside 21, to for the first time ever apply the same principles that we've been talking about here for legislation to connect the phone system to your constituent management system. And that's just, a, that's just one example of how it's changed our lives and our product development efforts because of revisiting and reviewing Congress as a systems map. Um, just building off of that, and I guess this is probably our, our last question, um, building off that, you know, we drilled down to get there on that bottom circle, right, constituent engagement to get to Article One. Um, where should people be drilling down? You know, I, I think it's fair to say everybody in this room and watching at home cares about building the best possible Congress. Um, where do you guys think people should drill down on this map um, with that in mind? Yeah, that's a good question. I think understanding, <clears throat> it, it's fun to watch. It, it's, it's great to listen to, to, to folks in this community talk about using the map in that way and trying to figure out where they fit and where their work fits and how, they're, how they can find partnerships. And so that's, that's great to hear, Seamus. And, um, you know, I think the drilling, the first part of drilling down is kind of probably understanding and look, the map's not entirely a perfect representation. It's a, it's a, it's our mental map. So you know, you can tweak it, you can draw on it yourself. It's great. Uh, but you know, understanding kind of the general area you're working on and who's with you. You know, I think that's great. And understanding who are your partners. I think you know, just to kind of pick it back on the, the other question and the stuff you're saying. Like, I think another thing we've learned is the the value of of collaboration and partnerships. There's no silver bullet here. Nobody's gonna, you know, make the surgical strike on this map that you know blows up the. The problems. Um, so understanding where you can work together, I think, you know, and looking at the places you know are stuck, are hard, you know, you're not going to change the ideological sorting of parties, probably by yourself, you know, and if you are, then you might have mil billions of dollars at your disposal to, but the, and you can do other stuff with that stuff, but the, you know, the congressional resources, tough problem, but think about how you can work upstream or downstream from those problems, maybe in the arrows, you know, maybe there's not a bubble there for you yet, but, you know, think about changing the, the diet, you know, the, the variances, the valiances, I guess, uh, of those pluses and minuses. And, mm -hmm. and I think the first step of that is understanding what's, this is how we made our decisions on, on strategic investments. Like what's the really hard things to move and where can we work around and create the change? That's really how you are trying to use these maps. And, I think that's a good way of thinking about, you know, strategy. Just don't charge up the, the highest hill, you know, and, and, and don't just go by yourself. Uh, and, and I think that's the, the good place to start, to start your thinking. Yeah. Daniel? So uh, sort of two things. One is that um, it's important to have sort of that, that holistic view and to realize that the piece that you're touching actually affects everything else and that you can make changes that, so, People don't, the, when people think of legislative data, they think of like bills and maybe they think of amendments and maybe they think of like vote information. That's kind of where it ends, right? They, they don't think that uh, the dear colleagues that they send out are legislative data. But if you want to figure out where people stand on an issue, that's a great place to go and figure it out. So if that information is available as data, you can sort of pull it in and, and solve you know, Congressman Hurd's problem. Or, or people don't think about press releases as legislative data, but if you, are in a member office in your, you know, and you put it out as an RSS feed, and then Derek Willis at ProPublica pulls them all down into a website, which is what he does. All of a sudden, you can search across all the press releases. So, you know, all these little, uh, the, the MRAs, the member expenditure accounts, is another example of that. So, like, they, you know, it's intended to be like an accounting tool, but it also lists every single staffer and what their titles are. So you can do that for other things. You can do that to talk about staff pay and capacity. You can do it to figure out who you're supposed to contact. So all of these things sort of mesh together. So while there is a big picture, and this is, you know, and you need to be thinking about that, 
the little piece that you're touching is probably something that somebody else needs uh, and, and you may not realize it. This, this little thing that if you just do it slightly differently and that you're aware of like the kinds of stuff that, that they might need or just that you want to have that flexibility that changes the way things function. So the congressional record, it's not available. Now it's gonna be available as PDF, that's great. Maybe even better, like later on, it's gonna become available as data. You can start doing analyses over the decades on how lawmaking itself has changed over time. Like th this empowers so many more things. Uh, so, you know, f for me, at least in this context, the map is a reminder that always, 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 the things that you're doing, that you're doing for a specific purpose, for a specific reason in your office or whatever, that actually it really has global effects that can change the way the whole system functions. Uh, either you can do it yourself or oftentimes other people can do it if you just uh, do it slightly differently and you make sure that other folks are aware of it. So it's, it's really getting back to what, what Chris and Seamus were hiding, which is the value of collaboration. Thank you. This is the Democracy Fund uh, Congress Systems Map, democracyfund.org democracy slash Congress Map. Daniel Schumann from Demand Progress, Chris Nels speaking on behalf of the Democracy Fund. I'm Seamus Kraft from the Open Gov Foundation. And my biggest takeaway from this, as a wise wizard just said, mm. not all who wander are lost. Thank you very much. <laughs>